Because all the titles in the EU Commission are long, and I, I have to read it, otherwise I'm going to mess it up. So, as you all know already, Colin Brown is the Deputy Head of the Dispute Settlement and Legal Affairs Unit and the Director General for Trade of the European Commission. Um, where, notably for all of us, he leads the team working on investors' aid dispute settlement um, and is responsible for formulating the EU's um, position uh, and approach to investor state dispute settlement among many other trade and investment issues. Um, in that context, he's led the negotiations between the EU, at least the legal aspects of the negotiations between the EU um, and its um, partners. Um, and uh, um, it's responsible for many other things. I'm going to picture that. But let me just say <laughs> that he's been working in the field of now investment, but also trade for quite a number of Too years. Long. You would not believe it, yeah. looking at Colin. Yeah, um, sure. But he uh, has been working on trade policy at the EU for a very long time, and actually um, a long time ago was actually uh, arguing cases before the WTO, uh, litigating WTO and EU law cases. Um, so maybe I will leave it at that? Sure. Okay, great. Thank, thank you. Yes, please. Yeah. Thanks so much. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you to, to Lisa for that introduction. It's a pleasure to, to be here. Um, I'm um, going to talk about the path to multilateral um, investment court. Um, I'm going to kind of divide it into um, three elements. The um, why multilateral investment court, um, what type of multilateral investment court, and how it should be, how it should be done. Um, and I'm, I probably speak for only for 15 or 20 minutes, so happy to have a, a discussion and engage in an exchange of views um, on this matter. So on the first, on the first question of why, um, the, the EU, um, the EU takes the view that sustainable development, sorry, sustainable investment is desirable for both post and um, home states. So from our perspective, it's extremely important that we are um, encouraging sustainable development. Um, it's also, at this moment in time, extremely important to uphold um, international law at a moment when international law is um, under attack. So whilst we believe that it's important to maintain the system, that does not mean that it doesn't need to change. It does in our view, clearly um, need to change. So why does it need to change? What are the issues that we have um, with the current system? I think the, the core issue that there is with the current system is whether it can ensure um, sustainable development and whether it can ensure the right to regulate. And I think in this perspective, um, the EU's views is that the EU's view rather is that the substantive rules in the bilateral investment treaties are not the core of the problem. I think we have to ask ourselves why these rules, which exist in one form or another in any other legal systems, are problematic in the investment treaty system, but are not problematic elsewhere. Um, and I think it's indisputable that these norms, when you have them in other legal systems, are not regarded as, as problematic, are not regarded in general terms as being problematic. And we think we have to think more about why uh, this is the case. So as you know, and I'm not going to go into a lot more detail on this, these rules are found in many um, other uh, legal systems, whether they be international, regional, um, or domestic. Um, you can take international rules, you find in the GATT WTO um, rules on non-discrimination, national treatment, most favored nation uh, treatment. You find also um, in many regional entities and regional setups protection, for example, against um, taking a property without compensation. The European Convention on Human Rights is a good example of that. And you have in domestic systems the same types of ideas. So the US Constitution, the Fifth Amendment, um, with the Takings Clause, um, and the, the well-known um, Supreme Court judgment in, in the Penn Central case, where 
domestic legal systems are protecting the same types of rights that are protected in bilateral investment uh, treaties. So our, our view is that there is something that is um, missing. Um, and these are the mechanisms that we have in our domestic legal systems which make these same rules um, acceptable in our society in one context but not in another context. And the mechanisms that our societies have created to deal with these types of issues, so this type of balancing between a public interest and a private interest, is the creation of um, permanent courts. Um, you can trace the history of this back to the Enlightenment in, in Europe and the United States. You can find this written particularly in the works of Bentham, Voltaire and um, Hamilton. And so our society, when faced with these types of problems in the past, has gone towards creating um, permanency. And this is what we think needs to be done in the investment system. We think if you bring it into the investment system, you address two key problems which are there. <coughs> One is the lack of predictability in the current system. Um, and we think that the lack of predictability is a concern because uh, for two kind of key reasons. One is that the lack of predictability produces a regulatory check. If you have one particular case, let's, you can take the example of the Philip Morris case against Uruguay, um, you can look at that case and you can say, well, that's very clear that um, a government, a society can regulate in the, in the interest of public health, and that is not inconsistent with uh, international investment. The, pro the problem, and you can perfectly well cite that case and feel very comfortable with that case, the problem is that if there's another case which arises, which has similar types of issues, you have no guarantee, you cannot be sure, you have no likelihood that the case would be followed, um, and the same type of report would be taken in another case, because you have three um, potentially three different arbitrators deciding um, on, on a similar um, issue. And this also has um, an impact on um, stakeholders. Um, because if you're um, a government legal advisor, for example, it's very difficult for you to say to your clients who are wanting to develop regulation on a particular issue, that, well, it's very clear this is consistent with um, um, investment rules. It may be, it may not be. We don't know what particular um, um, uh, tribunal may say. Um, and it's also problematic for um, um, stakeholders, for civil society wanting to understand what the obligations are. And it's also problematic for investors. Do investors spend money potentially bringing litigation when they, they are not reasonably comfortable what the, um, what the types of outcomes uh, will be. I think something which is very instructive to think about, but you're, most of you in this room will be, a few exceptions will be too young to remember this, um, is that when the WTO um, came into creation in 1995, um, it came at a time when there was quite a great deal of debate and um, argumentation about whether the GATT, so the, pre the predecessor of the WTO and then the WTO, properly ensured the balance between the right to regulate um, and, and free trade. And in the, if you look at what's happened in the GATT WTO system, nobody has changed the basic substantive rules. So the same basic rules, the non-discrimination rules, for example, um, the prohibition of quantitative restrictions, they remain there. They remain basically unchanged since the 1940s, the 1950s, when they were first drafted. What has changed is for, unfortunately under threat today, but what has changed is the creators of the WTO set up a permanent body to settle disputes in the, in the form of the, of the appellate body. Um, and because the appellate body over time has clarified um, the nature of the obligations, all stakeholders, governments, industry, civil society, they have uh, 
a better understanding of what these obligations mean, and, a, and most importantly, an expectation that a particular interpretation will be followed in the future. And that expectation is there because you have um, a permanent body. So we think that establishing a permanent body is important because it addresses this question of predictability. The other thing, the other reason that we think it's important is because um, there is, if you want, a, in many ways, a lack of a deliberative process in the investment um, regime. Um, so when you look, why do we, if I go back to what I was saying at the beginning, why do we, why do we trust permanent courts in our domestic systems to get this balance right? It's because the permanent courts are embedded in our domestic systems. They understand the balances that governments are trying to strike between uh, in what we're looking at protecting individual property rights and um, <coughs> regulating in a general sense. We all <coughs> think that international courts, certainly as experienced in the European Union, um, are also able to get that balance right. If you look at the way the WTO has, um, or the appellate body, has borrowed um, and has been responsive to other norms of international um, law, you can see that international courts are also able to understand the legal substantive issues they're dealing with in a broader context. And that's something that we think simply that ad hoc arbitrators um, set up for a particular case um, are um, unable to do. If you also have a permanent court or a permanent body, then you can have um, a process of adjustment and adaptation as our societies um, change um, over time. But you can only do that if you have an established body of case law that is the basis from which to have that um, discussion. Um, and we also think that the ad hoc nature um, of the system has also led to it being divorced somewhat from the normative discussions that treaty makers um, are having and should have. So setting up a permanent body is much more likely to engender a more structured um, discussion, a normative discussion between the um, treaty makers, the sovereigns, um, and the adjudicated bodies. And so that, that, those are the kind of the basic reasons that we think um, that it's desirable to work on um, a, a permanent body, a multilateral um, investment court. Our, our view is that the, the core of the problem lies in the design of the dispute settlement mechanism. That does not mean, I think it's useful to clarify this, that does not mean that we shouldn't stop discussing and thinking about the substantive um, rules. There's obviously been very good work that is being done um, and that will be done um, in the future. But we think the focus of our discussion and um, the focus of the reform process should be on working um, on um, the dispute settlement mechanisms. So I, I now want to turn and say a few words about what a multilateral investment court um, could, could look like. Um, so at its core, based on what I've just said, uh, as you would expect, the main, the main element that we want to install and to create is a permanent body. It's important to, to underline that we would have in mind a permanent body of full-time adjudicators. So the people that are asked to sit as adjudicators would not, be, would not have um, other activities beyond sitting um, on this particular court. In our view, it's important that it be a two-tier court. So we mean, first by that I mean first instance and a system um, of appeal. And the reason we say this is because we think that a two-tier structure is the only um, um, option, the only idea that is on the table that can adequately address the concerns which have been identified up to now in the UNCTRAL Working Group. So just to recall, the UNCTRAL Working Group um, in its last meeting a couple of weeks ago concluded that reform was desirable around th three core groups of issues. First, around the issue of the lack of consistency um, and um, correctness. 
Second, around um, arbitrators and decision makers, how they, they function. And third, around the issue of cost um, and duration. Now, our, our, um, our view is that um, a permanent body is the only type of um, response that can adequately um, address these issues that have arisen um, in the intertrial discussions. And we think you can, or we've, we've, we can think what we think we can enumerate at least ten points where creating a permanent body can respond um, to those concerns. So let me briefly walk through these these points. First, around consistency and correctness. And um, obviously, in top of this, this uh, um, earlier. Um, um, a permanent body can bring about predictability, it can bring about consistency. Secondly, a, a, a permanent body with an appeal mechanism can bring about correctness. It can correct errors of law that might arise at first instance, and it can correct um, egregious factual errors that may arise. Then if you look around at the question of arbitrators and adjudicators, third point would be that only a, a permanent body with a two-tier um, system can address the um, concerns about the perceived system of incentives operating uh, in the existing system. So you have um, ad hoc appointments by um, disputing, party, um, disputing parties. Fourthly, only full-time appointed adjudicators can address completely the concerns that arise about ethics and about double hacking. Fifthly, you can also address the concern that arises around um, expertise. You can more clearly appoint individuals that have a strong background in public international law or have a strong background as judges. Yeah, the art of judging, getting the balance between private and public um, interests correctly. Sixth, you can address the issue of diversity, both geographic diversity and gender, or the lack of gender and diversity. And that is, a, that is a problem you simply cannot address in the current system. You cannot address by having an appeal mechanism by itself. Around the issues of duration and costs, you have um, multiple ways that a permanent body would also reduce costs. So, for example, you wouldn't have the disputing parties spend time choosing arbitrators. You would have a court would be better able to control the costs in terms of the management of cases. And, and you had Philip Sands here. Um, a few weeks ago, talking about some of these issues and explaining how um, he felt, um, and, and he describes it very ably, how he felt that the existing system, because of the incentives built into the existing system, it's very difficult to control the costs. And the other thing, of course, is that predictability reduces costs. If you know that you cannot import um, ISDS clauses through um, the MFN clause, at a certain point, council will stop arguing it. But until they actually get to the point when they know they cannot bring the argument anymore, then any diligent council would make the argument in a particular case if it was useful for them. Um, so by, by bringing in predictability, you also lead to more focused um, litigation and you reduce costs. So that was the seventh point. An eighth point is um, more specifically on duration. So uh, according to exit statistics, it takes around six to eight months to appoint the arbitrator. So if you don't have that step in the process, the duration of the proceedings is, is um, shorter. And again, a permanent court is more able to, do, to control the time of the case. And Philip Sands gives the example of a, of a two weeks hearing when a three day hearing would be, would be enough. Um, and obviously, in terms of potential time saving. 
But we also think, and these are the ninth and tenth points, we also think that a permanent body will be better able at handling some of the other problems that arise in the existing system. One of them, which wouldn't arise immediately, but would arise as coverage expanded, would be around the question of management of multiple and parallel claims. So at the moment, of course, if you have a tribunal under one treaty, it's only dealing with a case under that treaty. But if you have a permanent body in the future that is covered multiple treaties, then it would be better placed and better able to manage multiple cases that might come in under different treaties but dealing with the same um, uh, actions and measures. And, and we also think, and this is the, the, the tenth point that I would uh, list, we also think that the, um, a permanent body would be better able to manage the relationship with other bodies of law, whether that be taking uh, cognizance of how um, uh, other international courts have dealt with particular issues, or whether that will be recognizing um, domestic legal um, institutions and domestic legal rules and better handling these. So one, one example of this where um, you can argue that the current system is not doing a very good job is in the area of shareholder claims. So arguably a permanent body that is more used to thinking of it and has a, 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 a permanent relationship to establish the different domestic legal systems will think more carefully about these types of um, issues. I, I'm not going to go further into the, um, the details of all of this, just I'm happy to do that in, in the discussion session. Um, but I think something else which I'd like to underline is that the key issue here, when one thinks about reforms, is to make sure that the reforms can be applied to the large stock of existing treaties. There are, as you will know, 3,000 existing treaties. EU member states are party to 1,400 of them um, with third countries. So it's extremely important that you have a system that can apply to these existing which in turn means that you need a fairly open and broad um, um, jurisdictional clause that we think would have to be done via um, a, an opt-in um, type of mechanism. But a broad jurisdictional approach also means that a permanent body can evolve with the times. Um, and we think this is important, as important as dealing with existing treaties. So you need, if you're going to create a permanent body, you need to give it the flexibility <coughs> to be able to handle developments <coughs> in the international investment regime. Um, one potential development we see increasingly happening is the possibility of um, obligations being placed um, on investors. So in our view, any permanent body must be set up in such a way that it can handle these types of evolutions as they may um, arise um, in the future. And that, in turn, takes me to the, the how. Um, and look, for those of you that have been observing um, discussions over the past period of time, you, you will know part of, of this. For the European Union, it's very clear that these discussions need to take place in a, a multilateral forum. This is not about the EU's views or anybody else's views being um, imposed. It's very important that we take account of the experience, uh, the expertise, the knowledge um, that is developed about the investment regime um, over the, the last period of time, in particular the last uh, 20, 25 years when you've had um, a, a significant number um, of cases. In our view, UNCITRAL provides that multilateral forum. It's a UN body, so the results of what is, what is ultimately developed, if anything is developed in UNCITRAL, would have to go to the um, United Nations General Assembly and be approved by the United Nations General Assembly. At the last um, meeting in Vienna of a couple of weeks ago, you had nine, 90 um, 
92 countries who are represented, if you include the European Union and the Holy See um, as, as countries. Um, and you had 400 delegates. So you have there um, a process that is both very open um, and it is very inclusive. From the EU perspective, we're very keen to ensure that it is really inclusive. So not just inclusive um, in name. With the Swiss government, the European Union has um, contributed to a new central travel fund um, which provides assistance to developing and least developed delegates to ensure, uh, sorry, delegates from developing and least developed countries to make sure that they can attend and that they can give um, their input. I think extremely importantly, it has to also be a government-led process. So it is the governments that need to set the agenda, it's the governments that need to lay out potential um, options, and it's the governments that need to, to make the concrete policy decisions um, in the working group. Um, and this is something I think it's important to underline, this is something that um, countries and governments have been conscious of when this issue first came to the Israel um, Working Group. And you can see that this notion that it be government-led is something which is explicitly built into the mandate in which Working Group 3 is currently working. So inclusiveness um, is important um, in this um, process. The input of civil society is extremely um, important um, in this <coughs> process. It is extremely important that civil society um, be present. Um, I think I can say this is a good place to say it, that we are very grateful for the efforts of CCSI um, in um, doing this. Um, CCSI, you might know, organizes stakeholder events um, in the margins um, of the working group. And that is something that we think is very worthwhile and that we're very um, supportive um, of. And so let me finish by saying that this is really a significant moment for the international investment regime. This is, if you go back and look at the history of the regime, this is the first time there has really been a multilateral discussion um, about ISDS. It's the first time that there's been a discussion since cases have started, since there's actually been experience with the, um, with the system. Um, we need to use it to make sure that the investment regime is indeed supportive of um, sustainable development. Um, and we have a chance now that we cannot um, miss. So we hope that um, others will engage with the EU in thinking carefully and constructively about how we should improve the system. Thank you very much. Great. Well, it leaves us time for a good discussion. Um, so, George. How do you, you guess? How do you guess? <laughs> well, um, you, you gave a, a, a very convincing account. Uh, perhaps to get to the heart of, of the disputes over this, what would you identify as the principled objections? And you've doubtless heard them repeatedly. <laughs> what, what would you identify as the principled objections to what you are advocating? Uh, and the most you can be selective, of course. Uh, <laughs> what are the most serious ones? Uh, and I underscore the word principle because, uh, you know, arbitrator self-interest is, is, is not on the list. Mm. Um, so principled, principled objections and your, your reply. Um, and I'm curious to know whether you have a response, as I think you probably will, to every one of the objections you're going to mention. I would just ask whether there are any objections that you that you don't really have a reply to, but you think they're simply outweighed. I hope that's clear. Um, there are objections to which you have replies and responses. There are objections that you acknowledge the legitimacy of and, and say, well, they are outweighed. Um, and I'm curious if there are what these objections are and what, to what extent they fall into those categories. 
it's, it's kind of a weird question, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it goes to the heart of the matter yeah. because you're you're engaged in debate constantly yeah. um, over over your proposal, um, and so it would be very instructive to us to know what you think are the matters you need to to take on uh, to create a, a wide as wide support as possible for what you're advocating. Okay. Do you have another 20 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> well, it goes no, to the I, heart I of can, it, right? Oh, no, absolutely. I, 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 I can hopefully be, be quicker um, that, than that. Um, so I, 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 there may well be uh, others, but I, I think there are three um, main issues. Um, and I'm not quite sure how I would categorize them in, in the way that you have, have put them, George. But so, so one is the question of if you change the system, you lose the ability of the disputing parties to a point. Yeah. So, um, and that, that kind of falls into different elements. So the first question is, but why? Is that, is that a right for disputing parties to a point? In many, in most cases, disputing parties don't have a right to appoint their judges. If you go to the court in New York City, you're not going to appoint the judge. You will take whoever judge is, is, a, is a allocated to you. Um, but I think that goes to a, a deeper question of these are disputes where you have an individual, a, a, a natural or legal person, bringing a case against the government. And so you have a question about, well, how do you ensure that the person that is sitting as the adjudicator is independent, is impartial? Um, and if you move from one system, how can you ensure that that happens in, in the, the next system or in, in a new system? And I think that that is, that is for many, the mm. biggest challenge that we have. Uh, there are other challenges. I've got another couple that I'll respond to. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, I think that in many ways is, 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 is the biggest um, challenge. And I think the response to that is, is partly the debate that this question throws up was open. Is this actually a right, or is this something that is um, that the investment regime has grown in this particular way because decisions were taken 50, 60 years ago to go this way, but they were they had other options on the table at the time, and instead of choosing those other options, they've gone for this option. Um, so I think there's a there's a question there of of how do you frame this? Mm. And then there's the question of, well, how do you actually create a robust system to make sure that you get the appointment right? Um, and that, that is a challenge. Um, I think the good thing is that we're doing this, I would say, 20, 20 odd years, 30 odd years after um, governments have tried to have gone through a wave of establishing other international courts. So in the 1990s, you have the International Criminal Court, you have the WTO appellate body, you have uh, International Tribunal of Law of the Sea, you have a number of courts that are, that are developed. And we have the advantage or disadvantage of knowing what has worked well in these courts in terms of appointments and what has not worked well. And we have the advantage of seeing how and governments have adapted these uh, organizations over time to make sure that you do get to as um, independent and as impartial uh, adjudicators <coughs> as possible. But that, but that is clearly the, the challenge. Um, and it, it requires very careful design of any new institutions. And that, that is a cool question. Second um, principled objection is the question of, and I touched upon this in my, my remarks, how do, you, how do you grapple with the normative development of the system? If you delegate these powers to an institutional body, 
we're doing that in part because that has greater legitimacy than the current system. But that, at the same time, means that you have um, um, more persuasive, more powerful results coming out of that institutional body. So, as we think about this, part of what we think also has to happen is that governments have to think more about how do they, how might they want to respond to um, or guide the multilateral investment course in the future. And many of those mechanisms are there that are already in existence. So things like um, binding interpretations or non-disputing um, uh, party um, interventions. Um, but this is something that we think you will have to think more systematically about than is the case in the current um, system. And then the third issue which I think comes up and is the one I also try to address in my comments is the question of scope. So if you work on dispute settlement, is that enough? Is it enough to, um, and, and we obviously argue that um, in, in it is core of the problem of the current system is but we of course have um, a great deal of debate about the substantive rules um, and here that, that is an issue which the interdrop process will have to grapple with how does it respond to the, um, the requests or the, the arguments that should be further work on the substantive rules something the international community will have to grapple with I think um, also more and it may be that if, there, if the UNICEF process leads to a successful conclusion that that is a catalyst for further work on um, potential substantive um, reform, potential reform of the substantive investment rules. So that wasn't quite 20 minutes. <laughs> but um, I think these, these are the three kind of yeah, core principled types of concerns that we get. Lisa, can I just have one more minute? Just yeah. a minute. Um, I fully agree with you about the, the leading principled objection. I mean, it, it dominates, yeah. uh, it dominates the, the debate. Um, and I just want to say, I think you've got lots of good answers to that. Thank you. Uh, we have a lot of international courts whose judges are named by governments. And I don't think anybody I know thinks that the European Court of Human Rights is unduly state friendly. Uh, perhaps others would disagree, but I, I, I don't think so. So um, I think you're, you're really in good, in good shape there in terms of your response. Um, just a word about the third. Um, one of the challenges I see, and it's not, um, it's not insuperable, but one of the challenges I see is that unlike the WTO appellate body that is dealing in any given case exclusively with a single text, as you've implied, I think, if we're going to have, a, if we're going to have an appellate uh, tribunal that's going to accomplish what you, you laudably want to accomplish, um, it's going to have a somewhat harder time of it um, trying to square uh, or distill principles um, in spite of or taking account of the differences among the treaties that exist. Yeah. Now, we know the only way to avoid that is to do what failed uh, decades ago in the OECD, which is to have not simply a dispute resolution mechanism, but agreed upon a single set of agreed upon principles. But from my perspective, for what it's worth, uh, I think that is a, is a challenge. And I, I don't think, um, to, to uh, revert to my question, yeah. um, I don't think it's dispositive. In other words, I don't think it kills yeah. um, right. your project yeah. um, in the least. But I would identify that as one of the biggest challenges. Um, are, are you actually going, are you going to accomplish what you want if the tribunals are narrowly focused on, on the particular treaty that is the subject matter of the case yeah. that is before them? And it's going to be a, 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 a very delicate task, I think. Yeah, can I, can I pick up on this? Yes. <laughs> so, so no, that, that, that's absolutely right. And, and so this is, this is simply one of, one of the circumstances that we have to deal with, which is that 
um, whilst there's a, a high degree of identity in, this, in these treaties, they are not identical. Um, and you can, you can divide that up in different ways, you can think about it in different ways. Um, they are not identical. What, what they mostly have in common um, is that they have um, four, um, depends how you count, basic substantive norms that are found in the vast majority of treaties that may be elaborated in different ways, but are typically found um, in all of the treaties. Um, and so the way we see this, I think it's very important, is that if, um, if the treaty partners have written the treaty in a particular way, that, that cannot be overridden by a dispute settlement body. So that has to be very clearly taken into, into account. Um, but you're going to have many treaties that are written in the same way, and so therefore a ruling in one case may not be dispositive, but will be very, very powerful yeah. in other cases where the language is identical, because the end the convention tells us we can't just look at the ordinary words in and of themselves, we have to look at more than that. Um, so that already is useful. Um, and then you're going to have other cases where, well, there may be a, a, a difference, um, but previous rulings will be will kind of provide a great deal of guidance. So let's say there's um, uh, for indirect expropriation. You have rulings dealing with the question of indirect expropriation that elaborate and develop and refine the idea over time. Um, and then you have a particular treaty that has a very sp uh, a much more specific language on. Um, indirect expropriation. Clearly, that language has to be mm -hmm. decisive in that particular case. But the background, the understanding, the analysis that's developed over time will then inform also that particular case. So you're right. We don't get to complete harmonisation, and that's that's not the, the objective yeah, here. Can't be. Can't be. Exactly. <laughs> as you say. It, it, it cannot be. But you can get to a, a greater deal, a greater level of predictability. And I was maybe too. I was using predictability in the unqualified sense. Oh, yeah. I just probably should have qualified it in my, in my introduction. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, please. Hi, I'm Jan Lotus from Leuven. And I, uh, I liked your talk very much, but I have too many questions. Is it a lonely fight or do you have allies? I mean, who are your allies? So which states and which stakeholders? Because I could imagine there are some clearly against, such as the country <laughs> where we're having the talk, which has been moving away from ISBS uh, stipulations already in investment treaties. So let alone think about multilateral institutions that would be a threat to sovereignty and so on. So I'm, I'm not sure, I mean, who your current allies are. And second point, was it that smart to bring the whole question to the UN and to UNCITRO? Because it will always be seen as an EU proposal. And we know in the UN, in many other bodies, there's always a lot of contestation when they can shoot on the, on the EU, they will not hesitate to do it. But, I mean, do you think indeed that in UNCIT, well, there are perspectives of a smooth and, mm -hmm. let's say, um, positive um, treatment of the problem? Mm -hmm. So on, on, on your first question, um, I, don't, I don't think this is the moment when we should be talking about allies or, or foes. Um, the, the Institute process has been set up with a very particular mandate. And it's been done expressly to first of all identify the concerns, then secondly think about desirability, and then third develop any particular solutions. Um, and what we have seen, particularly in these first two steps, is that many, many countries have difficulties with the current system. And those, those, different, those difficulties come in different ways. And some are more concerned by the consistency type of predictability concerns that we're raising. Others maybe more directly by costs, by, by duration. Um, others with, with um, questions around arbitrators and legitimacy that those issues um, arise. But what we see in the working group is that there is a great deal of interest in reform. Um, and I think that's partly because, as I was saying, we have, for the first time in 50, 60 years, um, a serious discussion at international level on the regime and whether it works well and whether it should be improved. We're about to move into the next phase, 
um, not entirely finished phase two, but we're about to move and um, slowly into phase three, which is the working on the solutions. And um, we will have to see um, how much support there is for, for our ideas. I've presented them here. Um, we've presented them in other various other fora. Um, many people know that this is the idea. I think there's, um, Anthea Roberts has written about the elephant in the room, um, complete with cartoons um, and her latest blog on this. Um, so th these, these ideas are going to be put on the table. And there will be a debate in the working group about what are the best responses to the concerns, what are countries interested in, in working on. And I think in terms of, if you look at the concerns, as I was trying to explain, this idea is the one that responds to them, the one that responds most effectively to them. And so I, I think there will be, and this is what we, the impression we get in the room, there is significant interest in thinking about these types of more systemic reforms. What that will actually come to at the end of the day, we will see. It, um, but it's also very appropriate, we think, with this in the United Nations. Um, because the, the, the reason that we take it there is because when we started to think about this project, the problem that we had was, well, how do you ensure inclusiveness? There's no, there's no point in the EU, I mean, we could all probably write a, a, a multilateral court instrument um, in, in a few days' work. It's not rocket science. There's some complicated issues that we've just been talking about, but it's not rocket science um, either. Um, but you don't, that's not how you, you, you build up um, a, a, a response to an international problem. You have to build up that response um, through a process which is inclusive, which takes into account the different experiences that different countries have had with this particular regime. And when you look around, there are some other international bodies that are active on investment, but our view was that Instatrial was best placed because I think what Instatrial has in the past at least proven is particularly good at doing is developing more technical solutions to these types of very complicated problems that we're, that we're facing. Um, so we think, and our experience thus far has been that um, there is a, a, I would say, a fairly positive open atmosphere in the working group. Um, it is not particularly regarded as a new project that therefore has to be stymied. It's, people are taking it seriously. So we'll see. There's many more bridges to cross. <laughs> Maybe you can have one last question. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Class, so maybe one last question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, you have one, right? Yeah. Ask that. <laughs> from Istanbul. I mean, um, you know, uh, 70, uh, more than seventy percent of the uh, investor state disputes are handled and then settled under the exit rules. And then, as you know, uh, the last August uh, second, McKinnier, uh, Madam McKinnier has published and then made public all the new uh, proposed rules of uh, the fourth amendment of exit rules. So uh, in parallel to the uh, conclusion of the last uh, 36th uh, meeting of the Ancestral Working Group 3, uh, two weeks ago in Vienna, uh, there are uh, the similar and then the same kind of uh, proposed amendments under the exit rules. For example, third party funding, uh, the uh, new gender balance language on the rules, um, transparency provisions, also uh, the facilitate for the expedited proceedings, and uh, the joining of the joinder of the NGOs, and then the new rules on mediation. So, and also Professor Antio Roberts uh, says that the West is dividing now between U.S. and then the uh, European Union. So. I mean, um, after the enforcement of the exit rules, I mean, is it possible, or if uh, still we um, continue to discuss about the inconsistency of the arbitral investor state arbitral rules between uh, multilateral uh, investment court in Europe and also the exit awards? Mm. So, I mean, our, our view of um, the exit reform process is, is the following. So I, so the European Union very much welcomes the, 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 
proposals that have been put forward um, in, in exit. We think it's desirable to take all types of steps that are feasible to seek to improve the existing system. Um, but I think our view is that the reforms that are put forward by exit um, do not ultimately go far enough in terms of responding to the type of systemic problems that we see um, in the existing um, system. So the way that we see this um, unfolding, but as I said, many, many bridges to cross, um, is that um, you know, we, we hope that the exit reform process moves forward and moves forward smoothly and relatively quickly. Um, but we would also see the slightly more medium term to long term project in Institral um, advancing um, as well. Um, and taking on, we would like to think, more of the systemic types of issues than the more specific issues that are being looked at in, in, in Exit. And there will be work to be done in UNSATRAL in terms of identifying what type of um, provisions are adopted in the Exit context that we can then also potentially bring into work in UNSATRAL. So one, one example, but there are other examples, is, as you mentioned, third-party funding. So third-party funding um, is an issue that I think is going to be is likely, it's not yet decided, but likely that the working group in Unsatral would want to deal with third-party funding. There's going to be a question about whether, you, whether it's worth starting that afresh or whether it's worth simply taking what would have been developed in Unsatral and bringing that in, uh, sorry, developed in Exit and bringing that into the um, Unsatral. Process. Um, so that that's a little bit how we see we see these two processes going forward in parallel. That the exit one normally should deliver much quickly, much more quickly than the um, the institute and one just the nature of things. Um, and so we're keen that 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 goes ahead, um, but we don't think it goes far. Great. I mean, right? Everyone to give a Columbia word of thanks. <laughs> You can try to get Colin here forever, so you all got lucky. Uh, with your indulgence, maybe students can come and speak to you for a few minutes. Yes, of course. Is that okay? Yes, of course. So take the opportunity. Great. Thank you. I've right. had lunch. You can also contact me on the I'm reasonably active on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so if you have questions, then you can speak to the claimant. Two.